Okay, welcome everybody to our evening lecture. Um, I think we can get started now. My name is Millie Lake. I'm an associate professor in the International Relations Department at the LSE, and I'll be chairing the events tonight. First, I just wanted to say what an honor it is to be here today in person to talk about environmentalism and international society. This is the first large in-person event we in the International Relations Department have hosted since the pandemic, and it couldn't be more timely. I can't imagine a more important topic for us to convene to discuss together here this month. As we come out the other side of the COP26 negotiations and the activism and mobilization surrounding them, many of us are reflecting on what these negotiations might mean for the future of climate justice and the transition to a sustainable global economy and society. I must confess that these past weeks of negotiations left me, like many others, feeling a little drained and a little disheartened, especially about the centrality of states and corporations in this moment of grave crisis, as well as the extent to which rhetoric, discourse, and normative commitments translate into real action in the face of vested corporate interests. However, it's possible that the book we're here to, to discuss today gives us some hope. First and foremost, that we are really at a critical juncture in centering environmentalism in world politics and thinking more deeply about what the integration of this new primary institution might mean. The book also raises many pressing questions about IR theory and offers profound contributions, particularly about the role of norms in this phase of the climate transition. I don't wanna take any time away from our panelists. So I just wanna say a few words of welcome to both our audience online and our audience here today in the LSE auditorium. First, I want to introduce Dr. Robert Faulkner, the author of Environmentalism and Global International Society, the book that we'll be discussing today and launching here at this event, coming out with Cambridge University Press. Dr. Faulkner is an associate professor in the Department of International Relations at LSE, and I'm very fortunate to have him as a colleague. He's also the research director of the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and Environmentalism at LSE and serves as the academic director of the TRIUM EMBA program and a distinguished fellow of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. In addition to environmental and global international society, he's the co-editor of the forthcoming book, Great Powers, Climate Change and Global Environmental Responsibilities, co-edited with Professor Barry Buzan. I'm delighted to welcome Robert here this evening to discuss this important, provocative and powerful book. Next, I want to welcome Professor Catherine Hostetler, Professor of International Development and the head of the Department of International Development here at LSE. Kathy holds a PhD in political science from the University of Minnesota, but has always been interested in the interdisciplinary study of environment and development. Her most recent book is Political Economies of Energy Transition, Wind and Solar Power in Brazil and South Africa, published in 2020. Next, I'd like to welcome Stephen Bernstein, Professor Stephen Bernstein joining us on Zoom. Professor Bernstein is a distinguished professor of global environmental and sustainability governance at the University of Toronto. He's a professor in the Department of Political Science there and co-director of the Environmental Governance Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. He co-edits the journal Global Environmental Politics and is a lead faculty member of the Earth Systems Governance Project. And finally, Professor Barry Buzan is an Emeritus Professor of International Relations at LSE and formerly the Montague Burton Professor here. He's an honorary professor at Copenhagen Jilin and China Foreign Affairs Universities, a senior fellow at LSE Ideas and a fellow of the British Academy. His most recent books, among many, include Reimagining International Relations with Amitav Acharya and Rethinking Sino-Japanese Alienation with Evelyn Goh. So without taking up any more time with introductions, I want to hand over to Dr. Robert Faulkner, and then we'll hear from Kathy, Stephen, and Barry in turn before a general panel discussion and Q&A in which we'll take questions from both Zoom and the room. For those Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Global Environmentalism. This event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. 
As usual, there'll be a chance for you to put your questions to our panel. For our online audience, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will come to me. Please let us know your name and affiliation when you do so. We're particularly keen to hear from students and alumni, so please let us know if you are indeed a student or an alumni of LSE IRD. For those of you here in the theater, I'll let you know when we will open the floor for questions. And if you can raise your hand when I indicate, you can remove your mask and press the button on your table mic before posing your question, and then you can put your mask back on. In the same way that on, the online audience provide their name and affiliation, I'll ask you for the same information before posing your question. I'll try and ensure a range of questions from online and our audience here in the theater. Since this is a launch event for Dr. Robert Faulkner's new book, Environmentalism and Global International Society, I wanted to also let you know that the book is available from our official LSE events independent bookshop, Pages of Hackney. I'm delighted to now hand the floor to Robert Faulkner. Thanks. Well, thank you, Millie, uh, for this wonderful introduction. And thanks to my colleagues uh, for coming out of hiding <laughs> and joining us here on this stage. Uh, and also thanks to Stephen, who's on the Zoom call from Toronto. Uh, I hope it's not too early there. Stephen, wonderful to have you in this event. Um, it's been some time since we've been holding public events in person here at the LSE. And I think it's high time that we got back into this. And I'm really thrilled to be able to launch my new book in this fashion. So thank you all for coming and, and uh, hanging in there with your face masks on. Um, I want to kick off by giving you a brief overview of the book, uh, just to set the framework for this conversation that we're going to have here. It's a bit challenging to compress a good 300 pages into 15 minutes or so. So what I'm going to give you is a few takeaways. Uh, we can then get into a little bit more detail, perhaps, in the conversation uh, with the panelists later on. But before I do that, let me start with a few remarks about the COP26 meeting that Millie has just mentioned. Um, after all, this was the most recent international mass gathering of diplomats, the biggest since the pandemic has started. It received a lot of attention. 120 odd heads of states were in attendance, tens of thousands of negotiators observers, protesters, campaigners were in the corridors on the streets of Glasgow. Uh, it creates a huge interest in the global green agenda in government, in business and in society. And there were some important decisions taken to get the world closer to a net zero future. But in, in many ways, that outcome was quite disappointing. The pledges that governments made are just not good enough to get us to 1.5 degrees, as scientists tell us we need to. There were some shady last minute maneuverings going on to weaken the final conference uh, text. And if you want to side with Greta Thunberg in her summary of the meeting, we got a lot of blah, blah, blah. So given the urgency of the climate crisis, I think it's fair to say that this was a rather mixed outcome that we got from such a high profile international diplomatic event. So what are we to make of this? States invest a lot of energy and effort into events such as this COP. And by the way, there are lots of other COPs, conferences of the parties happening for other environmental treaties. It is now standard for states to engage in that process. And yet they often produce such disappointing results. Why are we not seeing faster, more determined action to avert the global climate and broader environmental crisis? Is this just a case of symbolic politics, perhaps political hypocrisy, as some of the critics would argue? Or is there a more complex story unfolding in the background, one that needs deciphering? So in a way, my book tries to provide at least some answers to these questions. And I do so by stepping back from that uh, the sound and fury of international diplomacy. I dive deep into the history of environmentalism and I try and understand how environmentalism itself has become part of the normative structure of international diplomacy and of international relations. Okay, now I'm going to say next in order to move the slides on as I don't have control over them. 
So if someone could move over, thank you very much. So let me give you a quick overview of the book. Here are the three central questions that I try to address. One, is environmentalism a fundamental norm of global international society? Has it moved beyond being one of those marginal topics that we discuss at international conferences? Does it actually structure international, international relations in a deeper way? Two, if so, as I shall argue, when and how did environmentalism emerge as this fundamental international norm? And three, to what extent and in what ways has environmentalism then had an impact on the structure of international relations, international society itself? And as you can see, this is both about developing a historical account of the rise of environmentalism in international relations, but also an, an, an analytical uh, perspective, an account that seeks to explain the transformation that we have seen and also explain the depth at which that greening process has happened. It therefore engages with social theories of IR. I particularly engage with the English School of International Relations, which was very much pioneered here at the LSE. Um, and I believe that this helps us to get beneath the surface level of international diplomacy. It helps us to direct the focus towards the long view, the longer history of normative change in international relations. It also allows us to differentiate different levels of normative change that we can then unpack. And this is something I've been doing for a few years. I've tried to do in a few previous publications also in an article with Barry Guizan, published in 2019, uh, which might give you a slightly shorter version of 300 pages. And so I think there is a growing momentum, I think, in the study of global environment politics to take that long view and, and dive more deeply into the history of its, its uh, gestation. Next. So, so as not to confuse anyone, let me give you the argument straight up front before we go any further. I argue in the book that environmentalism has emerged as a fundamental, I call it a primary institution of international society. This is referred to as environmental stewardship from now on. This fundamental norm, environmental stewardship, has actually become universally accepted around the world. It has become globalized. And this makes it slightly different to other more recent uh, normative developments. Take, for example, democracy or human rights which also arose after the Second World War as global norms, but are not globally accepted. Interesting enough, environmentalism does span the different divides that characterize the international system. It is universally accepted. But then its socializing effect on states is rather more limited. And I argue in the book that it has a much stronger effect in terms of the procedural uh, dimension of international relations. States feel compelled to engage in multilateral negotiations, but then when it comes to the substantive side, do they actually implement what they pledge and negotiate? That's where the norm is much, much weaker. And finally, I also find that although well established now, environmental stewardship has not yet become systematically relevant to international society, unlike, say, sovereignty or uh, territoriality it doesn't yet decide whether states can claim to be legitimate players, rightful members of international society. You can break the norm without losing that form of legitimacy. Next. So what kind of international norm is it? I think we're all familiar with international institutions, so normative constructs that exist at the level of what is known in English school theory as secondary institutions. So these are the treaties, the international organizations that are formed out of the deliberate actions of states. They're often negotiated at conferences. So on the environmental side, we've seen a proliferation of these so-called secondary institutions. I've listed a few here on the right. The climate treaties are in that category, the UN Environment Program, and so on. Beneath that level, next, are what the English school calls primary institutions. This is a term that Barry Buzan himself described as deep and relatively durable social practices, evolved more than designed. So they don't get created in an in a instrumental way. They evolve, they emerge, they harden over time. And the argument is that environmental stewardship is now one of those alongside sovereignty, law, diplomacy, international law. Just for the sake of completeness, 
if we go to the next point on the slide, we could go one step deeper. We could also ask where do primary institutions come from and where are they rooted? So Christian Roy Schmidt has made the argument that beneath all this lies the nature of the state in terms of the moral uh, purpose of the state. Uh, we could talk about whether the state as such has become a green state, has adopted a green mandate. That would certainly underpin that green transformation in international relations. I don't think we're there yet, and I'm not going to engage in that debate, but I wanted just to illustrate how norms have deeper, deeper structures that we, we can uncover by peeling away the top layers. Uh, next. The important point for our conversation is primary and secondary institutions interact in important ways. The creation of secondary institutions, the hundreds, thousands of treaties that have been created, they reproduce primary institutions. So we know about the strength of the underlying environmental norm because we can observe institution building. But these secondary institutions also become then sites of contestation. So states fight over the meaning of environmentalism when they negotiate at COPs and try and change what they say about justice claims, about how fast we should move towards a greener future. So norms change. They change particularly at the secondary institutional level, but even at the lower level, we can detect forms of change. Next. Just briefly on the history of environmentalism, I spend a few chapters on this and trying to uncover the long history of environmental ideas and where they originate. I can only give you a brief rundown of the key stages here. It all started really in the modern era with the Industrial Revolution, which changed the way in which humanity related to the natural environment. Until then, most humans viewed nature as a threat, something that needed to be tamed. With the arrival of industrial technologies and the, the, the power to harness fossil fuels, uh, it was a a different relationship. Now humanity threatened nature. And so, so an environmental sensibility, an environmental ethic of care began to emerge. This is a domestic story. Environmental norms grew out of domestic debates, out of philosophy, literature, ethics, religion. But in my book, I argue that there's also an important international context to this, especially the colonial era. Empire played a big role in the creation of environmental knowledge. Colonial powers that moved to the tropics, discovered that they had difficult new challenges to master in terms of conserving nature in unfamiliar ecological territories. So a lot of conservation practice and knowledge was generated out of colonial uh, expansion. At the same time, those that suffered colonial oppression also developed a particular angle on environmental problems. For them, uh, it was colonial oppression that was one of the root causes for environmental destruction. And so in the 19th century, uh, different types of environmental thinking and knowledge and activism emerge, both colonial and anti-colonial environmentalism. It is then in the late 19th century that the first environmental movements spring up in the form of conservation groups, in, mostly in Europe and North America, uh, the Sierra Club, you see here John Muir with Teddy Roosevelt, um, uh, are those first inklings of a, of a transformation in politics but that doesn't get us very far yet. This is still an elite project, mostly middle-class, upper-class, aristocratic uh, individuals who want to protect nature uh, and, and want to preserve nature in its pure form. States, therefore, throughout the 19th and 20th century respond with fairly limited policy interventions. So environmental policy doesn't really get into a more systematic mode until after the Second World War. And it is then in the 60s and 70s the actual environmental revolution, the, the big change in the way in which people viewed nature. You can see here the, the poster of the first Earth Day in 1970, which brought out millions of people onto the streets of the United States. That produces a shift. Environmentalism goes mainstream, becomes a mass movement, and critically becomes electorally salient. Governments listen in a different way because they realize this has moved into the mainstream of politics. Next. There's also a parallel story of how environmentalism enters the international realm. I've traced this back to the beginning of the 20th century. This is perhaps a slightly forgotten history, not often told these days in textbooks. And interesting enough, the first proposal for a World Conservation Conference happened or was proposed in 
1909 by the Roosevelt administration. Uh, his successor, Tuft, didn't think highly of conservation issues, so the proposal was never followed through and it never happened. Instead, we get to a conference in Bern held by uh, various uh, European great powers in 1913. And interesting enough, the first ever international environmental body is created, the Consultative Commission, something that most of you, I presume, have not heard of. So it is not UN Environment Program, UNEP, that's the first environment body, but it's this Consultative Commission. But of course, 1913 was not a good year to found a new international body. Uh, the commission never took up its work, and after the war, uh, efforts to resuscitate it failed. In fact, most of the attention shifted to the League of Nations, and at the Paris Peace Conference, there was some lobbying by environmental campaigners to establish an environmental mandate. The great powers felt that this was not their business, not their responsibility, and this didn't happen. And the same repeats itself in San Francisco in 1945. The great powers again reject any calls for taking on environmental tasks. This was not yet recognized as a global responsibility. We see a limited role in UNESCO, but that didn't really change the matter. Next. So the big constitutional moment therefore happens only in 1972. At the Stockholm conference, the first United Nations environmental conference, which then establishes the duty of all governments is the protection of the environment. At the time, the environmental norm is not yet fully accepted around the world. There's a north-south and an east-west gap. The Eastern communist countries believe environmental uh, destruction is a capitalist phenomenon, so they ignore it by and large. Developing countries argue that one can't prioritize the environment over development. That rift is only really healed by 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit uh, in, uh, held in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, but the, the, the true constitutional moment is indeed 1972. And from then onwards, environmentalism makes its way into the normative structure of international society. Next. So what kind of normative transformation are we talking about? The English school, the theory that I employ in the book, gives us some conceptual language to talk about this. The two key terms here are solidarism and pluralism. I think it's fair to say that most environmentalists are broadly in the solidarist camp, in the sense that they speak about environmental threats challenging us, us as humanity, but also the society of states to develop a common purpose, uh, to discover our shared interests and common values in a greener future. So there is a, a logic of cooperation at work, whereby the society of states is, is asked to develop deep forms of cooperation, institution building, almost a green world government that would ensure that we live within our ecological boundaries. It's interesting that environmental multilateralism is very quickly accepted by international society. There's hardly a head of state who can stay away from any major COP these days, unless, of course, you're Xi Jinping and you're hiding in Beijing because of the pandemic, or you're Putin, and well, and perhaps you have a little bit more learning to do on the environmental front. But on the whole, most states can't get away from the need to engage in this agenda. That is now an established multilateral norm. But then, as I argue in the book, we've sort of the, the process of solidarization of international relations in a green fashion has stalled. Enforcement has never really been possible. Uh, we've created treaties, but we've not found a way to make sure that they are implemented. If anything, there's been a bit of a sovereignty backlash by countries like China, India, the United States, Russia, and many, many other countries. So in, in, in essence, sovereign statehood as a fundamental primary institution has been modified to some extent, but has not been transformed the way solid, solidarists might envisage it. Next. Some say, and we might get into this in the discussion in a moment, that the international system is heading, if anything, away from a solidarist future towards a more pluralist future in which a diversity of values, interests, and norms prevails, where we only accept our own national interests uh, and downplay the shared global interest. What fate does 
environmentalism face in this environment. The argument that I developed suggests that it is still possible to imagine a world in which uh, states come together at a very minim minimal level to deal with the common fate that faces them, particularly around climate change. This would be a logic of coexistence rather than cooperation. They might act out of some national interest or out of some sense of perhaps great power responsibility, a collective or individual hegemony to save the planet. But the point of this is, this would only kick in when there is indeed an imminent threat that threatens the national or the collective interests of international society. Uh, we're not there yet, and for that reason, the, 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 the kinds of cooperation we're likely to get are fairly shallow and weak, but that may change as the climate crisis spirals out of control. And that is indeed one of the interesting conclusions coming out of this work. Next, and then let me finish here with the last slide. So world society, where does the non-state world take us in this? If international society is perhaps not delivering as it is supposed to. Well, I've argued in the book that it is indeed world society, the domestic and transnational context of societal debate that have generated environmental norms. This is a case of norm transfer from world society to international society. And we see non-state actors lobbying states, haranguing them, uh, uh, pushing them, and, and morally shaming them. So that's continuing, and that's intensifying. There's a shift towards transnational environmental governance, and we should expect to see more of that. That's encouraging. Next. But whether we are moving towards some kind of green world society, where non-state actors take over is highly questionable. And I don't think we should expect any such move uh, soon. There is a solid risk component in world society. Much of the environmental movement is pushing in that direction. But I note in the book that world society itself is characterized by pluralist divisions. There are many different kinds of environmentalism and we should not expect all of them to pull in the same direction. There's indeed deep normative contestation, north, south, east, west, over this. And if anything, the sort of integration between world and international society is still far off. Uh, there is therefore still a lot of work to be done to move to that much more functional integration of these two units. So in short, the greening process has happened. International society has greened, but it's been an awfully slow process. If you measure it by the pace of change in international relations, it's been a record uh, uh, success. If you measure it by the demands of the global ecological crisis, it's been a painfully slow, probably too slow process to save us from the kind of fate that we might face if we don't control global warming. And on that front, I'm hoping for the panelists to come up with a more pessimistic assessment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. So I'll turn now to Kathy. We have the, the panelists will speak for five to eight minutes, roughly each, and then we'll open it up to you all for questions. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. It was a real pleasure to read the book. I've been hearing about it now for a few years <laughs> and not a few years, Robert, a few years. Um, and, and of course, a real pleasure to actually be here in person. About this time last year, Robert hosted my book launch and I think we really had no idea at that point when we were ever gonna be coming out of this. Um, and I remember doing the book launch and then turning off my computer and going into the kitchen and thinking this is really not the way these are supposed to be. It's so much better to be in the room. So very pleased then that we are in the room. Robert has already complained about having many pages to talk about in a few minutes. And I have the same complaint. Um, and so I think in my eight minutes that Millie said I can have, um, the, I think the most important thing I can say to you is that if you are interested in a history of the environmental movement that really, or environmental politics at the international level that really does start with the prehistory and takes you through quite an extensive period of time, a couple of hundred years, I can't imagine a better book to read that in. So this is really a good book to go and find that long history of the development of the environment as a global preoccupation. It's really an excellent introduction there. And it's history to a theoretical purpose. 
And the theoretical purpose is really asking the question, how do we know that a norm has taken hold? And I'm imagining that many of you might well be students of international relations, and you'll know that this is something that international relations is quite preoccupied with. We, many international relations scholars believe in norms, but trying to figure out if a norm is actually held, and if it is held, how it came to be held, why it's important, what its limits are, all of those things. And I say this as an international relations scholar who sometimes looks at norms, it's often very squishy. You know, it's often rather imprecise. We, we know and we hope that certain norms hold. And I think one of the great virtues of this book is that this is actually quite a probing look and it lays out quite an explicit agenda of what should we see if we want to say that in fact states have accepted a norm of environmental protection and what are the ways in which we see that. And so I want to just take a few minutes to talk about the ways in which Robert talks about how we see that norm is taking hold. And then he's got something in this historical section that I think is even more important and interesting or, or equally important and interesting, which is a discussion of where do we see that the norm hasn't taken hold? Where are the limits? And I think both of those are really important parts of this history that he tells. And so in general terms, and you heard him say this in different words in his own introduction, when we say that a norm has taken hold, we want to see that reflected in institutions. We want to see states actually doing things in their international negotiations, negotiating agreements. Um, we want to see that in practice, but we also want to see it in state behaviors, in the things that they do. And we want to see that it really changes their understandings of what is appropriate behavior in the international system and at home. So there's some pretty clear expectations that he lays out in the book about what it is that we should see if we're going to say that this norm has taken hold of international society. And so, um, and this is something, and I'm now really talking about these last 50 years since that constitutive moment. Is it 50 years mm -hmm. since, uh, since Stockholm? Next year. Next year, 50 years. So this is, this is younger than I am, this whole process. And you know, it's pretty recent really. And that's why he says that this is a pretty fast process of taking on a norm. And some of the ways that we see it, he lays out in the book very clearly. And, and I show these numbers also in my global environmental governance class. There's just this rush of writing of multilateral environmental treaties. But maybe even more than that, there's the way that this begins to make its way into other areas of international relations, where suddenly the World Bank and the trade agreements are starting to talk about the environment. And they do so in very specific and somewhat limited ways, but you do begin to see then the movement of this set of ideas and of the set of commitments into a whole series of international institutions and agreements. So this is part of what he's documenting in this history. He's also documenting the way that leadership changes over time. There's no big hegemonic leader that's imposing some kind of agreement on everyone else, but you do see leadership mattering. At one point, it's my home country, the United States, and then the United States very much drops out um, in the 1990s, and the European Union begins to rise as a leader. And then one of the parts of the book that I find the most interesting, and I say this as somebody who's in the Department of International Development, is the way that this whole process becomes really more truly global, so that it passes on to a set of developing countries as well who are now increasingly important, um, really protagonists in these international negotiations and in these international agreements and the taking on of this international norm. And one of the nicest parts I think of this historical section is talking about the way that the environmental debate itself had to change. It had to take on more fully ideas about the ongoing importance of development as well, that you had to join that environmental norm with a development norm and think about how those things fit together. And that was an important part of making this something that was actually a global phenomenon and not something just limited to a fairly small set of wealthy states. 
And that was, you know, that's an ambiguous process because in the process, certainly some people think that waters down the environmental norms. There is sometimes a trade-off between environment and development, but not nearly always. But those became then really critical debates. And if the norm hadn't taken that track, it could never have been as inclusive and covered as much of the world as it does. So I think that that's a very important story that he tells in that part of the book um, and, and, and becomes then part of a routine part of the international system so that pretty much everyone shows up, pretty much everyone sees that this is a task for states to come and talk about what they're going to be doing with respect to the environment. So that's, that's the first, um, I think, really important history in the book. But one of the things that I personally found most interesting was the way that this history also acknowledges some of the limits of that take of the, of the norm. And one of the parts of the, of the story that I found quite interesting was the way that repeatedly states took up the idea of like creating a meaningful international institution to deal with environmental issues. And they repeatedly chose to create weak international environmental institutions. Let's have a United Nations environment program, but let's not give it remotely the resources and the agenda that other international institutions have. Oh, we've created a World Trade Organization. Why don't we create a World Environment Organization as well? Oh, no, I don't think we'll do that. And most recently at the Rio Plus 20 conference in, in 2012, and I was there, it was one of the last big international conferences that I went to, again, a discussion about can we, can we do a double upgrade of our environmental institutions? Um, actually, I think we won't. And so there is this ongoing refusal on the part of states to really create the kind of strong international institutions that you might want to see. There is a norm there, but there's clearly some limits that states themselves are placing on the norm. And probably the most depressing part of it, and there is often some rather depressing parts of books on international environmental politics, but is where Robert runs through a series of quite important environmental norms more specific norms like the norm about polluter pays or a norm about environmental justice being a critical approach to the to environment and says, actually, when you look at what states have done in the international system, those norms turn out not to be very fully realized and not very fully taken on. So one of the things I take away from that is that one of the real contributions of this history is how clear eyed it is in that it gives us a very clear story about achievements. But at the same time, it gives us an equally clear eyed story of the limits of those achievements. And I think we have to eventually ask whether, you know, whether what we've achieved is up to the task. So Robert says in the book, there's not much disagreement that we do as states, as an international society, need to take on these environmental issues that most of the debate right now is about, well, how will that be done? But, you know, maybe going back to Greta's question, you know, is that how good enough? And many times when you do a book launch, you're supposed to be critical of the book. Um, as you can hear, I don't actually have a lot of criticism of the book. I have maybe a few more criticisms of international environmental politics, because I do think that these are some very serious questions to be asked, that when we have this kind of clear-eyed view of where we've gotten, is it enough for our global environment to, to take the norm only as far as it has been taken by international society. Thank you, Kathy. I'll turn over to the Stephen on Zoom now. Is that? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I do wish I could be there in person, but I guess this is second best under the circumstances, but I will have a glass of wine later, Robert, to celebrate, um, as I'm sure uh, hopefully you all are uh, after, after this discussion. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, to the celebration of, you know, Robert's fantastic book. Um, I just wanted to state at the outset that Robert is one of a relatively small set of global environmental politics scholars who directly uh, 
engages with the field of international relations um, and is a leading voice really of those who engage directly in this case um, with the English school. So this is a really, I think, big book uh, in that regard. Um, not only does it have something to say about the treatment of environmental issues internationally, but about the transformation of international politics or the potential transformation as a result. And it really flies in the face of what in North America has been a discussion about the lack of engagement, supposedly, uh, between politics, uh, political science and environment or political or environment and international relations. Um, Robert's been doing this for 20 years. And uh, this book really, I think, is, is Robert's grand statement um, on, this, on this engagement. I'm going to focus my remarks mainly on the book's argument about what kind of norm environmental stewardship is and how it contributes to understanding change in both international order and addressing international environmental problems. So as a starting point, let me just say that I'm completely persuaded, uh, so I'm not going to talk about in a lot of detail, that environmental stewardship is a primary institution in, a, in English school parlance. Um, but the real impact of the book is unpacking what that means for the theory and practice of international politics. So there's two central questions that I, I'm going to talk about in that regard. First, what kind of norm is it? And second, is it a strong or weak norm in supporting the needed politics to fulfill its purpose? The norm's purpose. So on the first question, uh, Kathy's already sort of mentioned this, I think the book is excellent. Um, not because it gives a definitive answer of what kind of norm it is, but because it doesn't shy away from exploring the enormous amount of normative contestation that swirls around the fundamental acceptance of environmentalism as an entrenched, legitimizing, even constitutive norm of global order. So I don't have the time to go into the detailed discussion of all the um, uh, of, of the various uh, um, the various specific norms that Robert uh, talks about in the book. Um, I'll just mention a few of them. He talks about, and again, Kathy mentioned some of these regulatory norms like the precautionary principle, norms around justice and norms that define or limit the distribution and depth of responsibility of states and major powers to address problems. Um, as well as questions of responsibilities for environmental harms and redress. He addresses all of these questions head on in the book. And what the book highlights, again, it's not the answer to how these norms are going to be worked out, but that they can't be ignored, that they've been central, become central to the discussion in global politics. Um, and states can no longer avoid addressing these sorts of questions. I'd even go a little further than Robert, who I think has been a little too influenced when he was writing the book by the Trump era. Um, he discusses sort of the, the backlash and anti-environmentalism, the populism, and how this perhaps is, is um, threatening the norm of environmental stewardship. Um, I would argue actually that it, in fact, it's become completely normalized. Um, opposition to it is simply seen as inappropriate. So the questions are around the means to address it, the priority granted to it, um, but it is no longer a question of whether or not environment is fundamental to uh, dealing with uh, political questions and, and to the international uh, order. The second question is a tougher one. Um, that is the question of the strength or power of the norm. The book, well, the book doesn't shy away from discussing the question. I'd really be curious ultimately to where, Robert, you come down on this question and the degree to which the analysis of the book is enough, is enough to help us answer this question about strength and impact. On the one hand, um, the book doesn't pull any punches. It recognizes that despite the spread and entrenchment of environmental stewardship, uh, global international society has, to quote the book, not managed to curtail, let alone reverse some of the worst forms of environmental degradation, climate change and biodiversity loss being amongst the most dire, but we could talk about many different environmental problems. So is it a norm that exists, to put it maybe a little less diplomatically than Robert does in the book, and I'm quoting Haley Stevenson here, is it a norm that exists, quote, in an age of bullshit? Um, that's the title of an article that she recently wrote, uh, um, uh, riffing off of a phrase from a philosopher, Harry Frankfurt, um, a, a book that she wrote criticizing the Paris Agreement. The analytic frame of the book discusses whether and to what degree, um, the, the, the analytic frame of the book tries to answer this question, um, and it uses the language of the English school and concepts of, of the English school to do so, 
um, by discussing whether and to what degree the norm reflects a pluralist or solidarist vision. Um, ultimately, I think that uh, Robert's very cautious, and he said this earlier about the norm's transformative potential, um, which raises the question of whether we can really view it as autonomous from other primary institutions or, it's, or on equal footing. So I would argue that it's probably adapted more to other primary institutions than vice versa, and even to developmentalism and, and, and the market. Um, and I think here the jury is still out on how much the progression has been from what I've called liberal environmentalism of the 1990s that basically accommodated it itself to developmentalism and the market, um, whether this shift to the sustainable development goals or ideas like net zero, whether that really marks um, a significant shift or not. The last section of the book tries to answer this question and it spends a lot of time um, talking about whether there's been a kind of move from pluralist to a solidarist model on the one hand or toward a more globalist world society on the other um, and the ways in which these do or do not challenge sovereignty and other uh, primary norms. Um, I, I really like that the book recognizes that these are ideal types and that really determining what kind of norm it is um, depends on where one looks. One can see evidence that it exists in these different quadrants. Um, and I think that's, that's important to recognize that, that um, there's an interaction between these different quadrants and probably we're not in, in one or the other. So the last three chapters of the book, uh, substantive chapters really address this. There, it's a very rich discussion. Um, you note that there's been some move to a solidarist and globalist direction, um, but this directionality is often ambiguous. And I think that um, one of the big takeaways for people who read this book who are you know, interested in this question is that it provides a deeper structural context to debates in the literature that have been around for a, a bit around complex, multi-level, multi-scalar or polycentric global governance. And here I would just push Robert a bit, and maybe he can say this in his response, to be a bit more definitive in elaborating the, quote, integrated world society concept, um, to see how helpful it is in making sense of what many are observing empirically on this front. And just to give my own bias, you say there's three different ideas of world society. I think this integrated um, conception is really the one that resonates in this area. Um, but you seem sort of reluctant to go in that direction. So I am curious. Um, finally, just on this point, um, I think through the lens of the book and the analytic frame, some people reading it might be a little frustrated in trying to answer the core question of how much the norm uh, matters. So if you look, for example, at the Paris Agreement, which ostensibly reflects, reflects a strong solidarist understanding of cooperation that pushes towards the greening of sovereignty in international society, especially if it's read in the context of, of you know, the some 1400 other multilateral environmental agreements, um, which have many common, even if contested norms that underpin them, um, and even has elements of an integrated world society. But in practice, instead, you could argue that the Paris Agreement reinforces pluralism, it devolves responsibilities to states, its focus is on national, nationally determined commitments, even though it recognizes that action is happening at all levels and by multiple actors. So in this view, the primary institution of environmental stewardship has done little to transform other fundamental norms. And we see this too in the SDGs, where we have an articulation of these goals, but the strongest articulation and most complete articulation of goals around environmentalism and sustainable development um, do not include clear commitments, responsibilities, or, or obligations. So the jury is really still out on the transformative potential. Um, what the book does do is provide us with a macro theory of change and continuity to contextualize and assess the possibilities of such transformation. And there, I think it's a major accomplishment. So congratulations, Robert. Um, and uh, again, I'm really glad to be a part of this celebration. Thank you, Stephen. And I'll turn now to Barry. Thanks very much. Um, well, I would like to endorse what the other speakers have said, especially Cathy's point about how nice it is to be here in flesh, as it were, uh, a real live event again. Um, my uh, tail end Charlie role here, I think, is going to be uh, maybe to be slightly more optimistic than Robert is expecting me to be. Um, I want to look ahead a little bit, not just about where 
uh, the environmental stewardship uh, primary institution has got to now, but where it seems to be going. I think uh, an interesting way in the English school uh, framing of seeing how influential a new norm is, is, is to look at the way in which it impacts on and interacts with the other existing uh, primary institutions of international society, of which there are quite a few. Um, and I think in this case, uh, the, uh, the uh, environmental stewardship uh, primary institution has already made uh, a substantial impact on a number of other uh, institutions and is likely to continue to, uh, to do so. Uh, I mean, it could conceivably become in the not too distant future, the most important primary institution that we've got in terms of its impact on other things. So I want to slightly kind of look ahead and see how that might work. Uh, I think there are three kinds of challenges that uh, it poses to the, uh, the other primary institutions. Uh, the first one is the challenge of, of uh, sustainability. It's, uh, Stephen already mentioned this. Uh, and my sense is that this challenge is already quite well underway and it's impacted on two, uh, the two institutions that uh, Steve mentioned, uh, development um, and the market, if you, if you want to think of that as, a, as an institution. That really the shift, certainly the rhetorical shift, and to some extent, um, never mind all the greenwashing, but to some extent, the actual shift towards sustainable development is quite real um, in the sense, as, as Steve said, people take this seriously now. That isn't question that development has to be uh, uh, sustainable development. Otherwise, what's the point? I mean, there are some, uh, uh, some diehards still, uh, still resisting this, but that has been, I think, uh, quite a, a big turn in the last, uh, in the last years. Perhaps there's so far been less of an impact on, on the market uh, or capitalism, if you prefer to see the institution uh, uh, that way. But uh, the big uh, uh, consequence in front of us uh, is that the market has to reassess how it calculates cost um, and, and, uh, and profit. It's got to factor in the environmental consequences uh, of, uh, of production and marketing and selling and all of that. And that's clearly beginning to be the case. So I think there's already some quite palpable movement in, in those two key institutions around the issue of sustainability. The second challenge um, is about globalization, basically, or globality, if you will, that we've got very used, particularly in international relations, uh, we got very used to thinking about globalization largely in terms of the global economy, uh, and the global and the international market and, and all of that. Uh, now, that form of globalization has been taking a fairly severe battering um, of late and is somewhat in retreat. It's very easy to find discussions of uh, you know, globalization in reverse. But in a sense, environmental issues, particularly global warming, are creating a new kind of globalization. Right? a shared fate globalization, if you will, not one that we can get out of. Uh, the market, we have choices about. Uh, global warming, we don't really have the same kinds of choices uh, because it's there uh, uh, growing up in the background. And this, it seems to me, is changing the meaning of globalization and will continue to do so quite substantially. It's quite easy to imagine that uh, the current trend towards economic nationalism will continue for some time and that therefore globalization in market terms will weaken. Uh, but while that's happening, I think globalization in terms of uh, environment, and particularly climate change, is going to be getting stronger. And this form of globalization, if it gets stronger in that way, is going to challenge the various fragmenting institutions um, in, in international society. I'm thinking here of sovereignty, um, of nationalism, of territoriality those, as it were, agreed institutions that are agreed in the sense that uh, <clears throat> their agreements are within humankind uh, about in what ways it's legitimate to divide ourselves up and differentiate ourselves into different kinds of, uh, of groups. Those are all going to be challenged um, by this new uh, uh, environmental driven norm uh, and uh, institution of environmental stewardship. The third challenge is, I think, to do with management. Some of this is quite straightforward and some, and some of it's not. Um, I think uh, the environmental stewardship is already beginning to have an impact uh, on 
the institution of, of human equality. Uh, that's a complicated issue. Should it be human equality or human inequality? But I'll make the case that human equality is basically uh, uh, the prevailing norm now. And global environmental pressures are raising new concerns about that, uh, about uh, different degrees of vulnerability amongst people in different parts of the world, about different degrees of ability to adapt uh, to climate change and, and other environmental issues uh, between uh, the richer and poorer parts of, of the world. So uh, that, uh, in that sense, is uh, environmental stewardship has added uh, another, another dimension to that particular institution. It's also beginning to affect, I think, the institution of great power management. Um, it hasn't yet uh, become a kind of focal point uh, of great power management. It's not uh, being extensively debated in the Security Council, but it is there as a new, uh, a new agenda point. And I think, I'm thinking ahead about how this might, might work, if, as some of you have argued, you know, the COP process and the diplomatic side of, uh, of environmental stewardship is too little too late, even though impressive in some ways in itself. The alternative at the other end of the spectrum is anybody and everybody going off unilaterally to do their particular geoengineering projects without consulting anybody else. The middle ground there would be a group of great powers agreeing on what kind of uh, geoengineering they might do together. So it's conceivable that not too far down the line, if things get worse, uh, you might find environmental uh, stewardship reinvigorating great power management in some, uh, in some ways. I think the, the impact on uh, diplomacy and international law uh, to other uh, primary institutions of international society is very obvious. I mean, there's been a lot of diplomacy. It's added to the diplomatic agenda, uh, and it is certainly adding to the agenda of international law. So it is, in a sense, uh, not changing these uh, these things so so much, but expanding and, and extending their role. I could talk quite a bit, uh, but I'm not going to. I'll just mention it. But I mean, in, in my particular view, which is not uh, as yet widely shared, uh, I would count science and religion as institutions uh, of international society as well. And there's a very interesting dialectic going on between these two, uh, which has been going on since the 19th century. In my view, they've more or less established a kind of draw, um, or possibly with, with religion, superstition, and conspiracy theory, and something like uh, with a, a slight edge. Um, uh, climate change and environmental stewardship reinforces both of them. Right? Um, so it, it adds another dimension to this dialectic between them. The scientists, in a sense, are trying to provide us with, uh, with answers and, and solutions, uh, whereas uh, various religious uh, parties can mobilize this as God's punishment for sinful human beings and other sorts of ways uh, in, in which this can, uh, this can be done. Okay, I'm running out of time here. So to wrap up, I think um, if environmental stewardship uh, gets stronger, as I expect that it will, uh, <clears throat> then it, it has a good chance of becoming the core institution uh, of global society. And it will make big changes of the kinds I've hinted at uh, to the structure of global society by the impact it has on the other institutions. Um, if it doesn't succeed uh, in becoming the core primary institutions, then the gathering consequences of global climate change will force big changes into uh, the structure of international society anyway. So either way, uh, environmental stewardship is the big story of the day here in terms of, uh, of international society. Uh, and I agree with the other commentators that if you want to get uh, the best up-to-date take on this, then start with Robert's book, because it's the best thing that's out there at the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much to, um, to all the panelists for those really, really thought-provoking um, comments, remarks, questions. And so now we'd love to, I would normally pass to Robert, um, to, to respond in, in brief to these comments. But I think what I'll do is give you all the opportunity to ask a couple of questions first, and then I'll turn back to Robert and the other panelists in turn um, to answer some of those. So first we'll take three questions from the room, then I'll turn back to the panelists, and then we'll take three questions from the Zoom participants. And then if there's a, 
opportunity to take more, we'll, we'll come back to the room and to the Zoom group um, accordingly. So please do raise your hand if you have a question. Wonderful. Okay, let me see if we have other, can we take three? Yeah, okay, perfect. So I see so one question here and then I'll come to you and then to you. Perfect, go ahead. If you could state your name, press the mic and take your mask off to ask the question. Otherwise it's a bit difficult to hear. Oh, hello. So my name is Tina and my LSC student in IR. And my question to Dr. Faulkner is, um, for the interpretation of international society, um, whether you take it as like a global international society or like a more regional approach, because if we take like international society with like a regional approach, would it be more acceptable to certain states like Russia or China if it's more regional? Thank you so much. And I'll take your question if you can press the mic and take down your mask. Thank you. My name is Arthur. I'm also an LC student in international relations. Um, so you join your class, I'm very excited about it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if we can compare the COP to the GATT uh, for the Mock Institution and then uh, for the COP for the Environmental Stewardship, could we have a World uh, Environmental Organization that develops, um, as mentioned beforehand? And if so, what would it look like? Wonderful, thank you, Arthur. Um, and then at the back there, thank you. Hi, uh, Jack Warden, also an LSE student in IR. Um, and I maybe what's an obvious question, but I'm curious if there's a kind of a direct connection between narratives of global risk and environmentalism, or do you think that environmental stewardship as a norm kind of transcends that distinction between, I guess, more economic material risk and a deeper kind of pluralism of, of value? Wonderful, thank you so much. So Robert, I'll turn to you to maybe respond to some of those questions and anything in the panelists' remarks um, for a couple of minutes, and then we'll see if the other panelists want to chime in, and then we'll turn back to the Zoom room to take another round of questions. Thank you. Lovely, great, great questions. And then thanks to the discussants uh, for, for wonderful remarks. Um, so I'm going to abstain from responding directly. And then I think some of those issues will come up in the Q&A. Let me tackle the first question first, and then I, I won't answer every single question because there, there's a lot of expertise on this panel. So let me move on to the first question about global versus regional international society. So the, the distinction is made to signify that there can be, and there have been many different international societies. Societies live and die by certain rules and they have a spatial extension. They go up to a certain point. Uh, their membership can vary and that's widely recognized. When it comes to environmental norms, we do find that the strength of environmentalism varies according to different regional international societies. So there's a short section in my book where I talk about how environmental norms have become, for example, constitutionalized in what we might call the European International Society, the European Union's constitutional framework, where environmentalism has actually been written into the treaties of the European Union and is now a mandatory dimension of policymaking in the EU. I'll leave it to you to judge how successfully the EU has done that in, in various areas. And that contrasts with other regional international societies. So if you take Russia and its former Soviet republics, if they form a, a kind of a quasi-regional international society, I'd, I'd probably guess that that is a less strongly environmental, uh, environmentally structured uh, setup. So we can certainly distinguish different spatial dimensions of the greening of international society. But I still think the interesting phenomenon is that environmentalism, environmental stewardship has become globally accepted. It's that universality that is quite striking. There just isn't a single major power that rejects environmentalism outright, the way China rejects Western notions of human rights and a growing number of countries don't think democracy should be a constitutional element of international relations. And that is the one distinguishing feature. And then that goes back to Barry's more optimistic reading. That is indeed encouraging. There are very few new norms that have been created in international relations that have taken the world by storm the way environmentalism has. Bad word to use storm because firestorms may, may soon drive that agenda 
much faster. So let me stop there and then perhaps other panelists want to come in to our questions. Thank you, Robert. Kathy? Well, maybe I'll pick up on that second question about the, you know, do we have maybe the possibility of some kind of world environmental organization that would be similar to that that emerged out of the trade regime? And the answer in, in short is no. Um, and there's a couple of parts of that. I mean, a, a number of years ago, I was actually in a comparative research project where we were looking at the environmental organizations and the human rights organizations and the, and the gender organizations and negotiations all in one big research project. And one of the things that we learned in that project was that actually institutions often were the most complicated and difficult thing for states to agree to do. And there were a couple of things there. I mean, one of them was because you know, there's some contestation around all of those ideas, right? Gender rights, human rights, environmental rights. Um, and, and creating an institution means that you're really serious about doing it. And so that's already an issue. But then institutions also then come along with, you know, their bureaucracies. They have like people who work for them. Somebody has to pay for that. And so there's a second kind of boring set of institutional questions about countries don't want to create institutions because they don't want to pay for them in a in a sort of small sense either. But I think the I think the real larger argument though is that we should look at international institutions and understand that they actually really reflect what matters to states. Mm -hmm. And that the the trade regime was able to create a very strong institution because the countries of the world wanted to for a series of very different reasons and they wanted the trade arrangements enough to make that a powerful institution with real dispute resolution powers and the like and and why haven't they done that for environment i think it's because the environmental norm is not as desirable to them as the trade norm and i don't see that i mean the trade norm is actually under a lot of threat these days also but um i don't see that it likely that the environmental norm in the near future will gain that kind of power there's a kind of revealed preferences about the development of international institutions and one of them is that trade matters more to most countries than environment does mm -hmm. thank you kathy um stephen do, do you want to chime in on any of these points um <clears throat> uh very briefly just on the point kathy made um I, 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 I could actually talk about institutions for a long time, but I, I, I won't. Um, <laughs> Kathy made several of the points I want to make, but just sort of historically, if you are interested in this, um, this discussion was very active in the lead up to Rio plus 20. Um, there were proposals, um, uh, anyway, I was sort of, I was close to these negotiations actually, and there were, there were proposals to upgrade, and I think Robert met, sort of mentions these in passing in the book, to um, upgrade UNEP, which was actually, um, and to create something like a Sustainable Development Council. And Kathy's raised several of the issues about why it didn't happen. Um, there is a new high-level political forum on sustainable development, which sort of oversees the sustainable development goals. Um, but the reality is, is that there was, there was political contestation over what exactly such an institution would actually do because there were debates between the sustainable development side and the environment side. Um, and also there was a complete lack of willingness to have this idea of some kind of umbrella institution um, when you had existing bodies that dealt with all of the various different environmental agreements and so on. So it looks very different than the, than the GATT, that model actually wouldn't work in the environment. Um, but there's lots of other reasons that Kathy talked about. So the short answer is, no, Rio plus 20 was probably the last time in the foreseeable future that we'll see this discussion. That doesn't mean things won't evolve in other areas. And I think I'd like to hear from Barry maybe. I mean, this is where things like geoengineering and so on, where there, there may be big issues that come on stream where you need strong internet. Well, there should be discussions at an international level about how to govern these sorts of things. Um, I could see that it won't be overarching, but you could see in specific areas where there'll be pressure for more authority um, and real discussions around governance and distribution and justice and so on that will play out because states will act unilaterally without them. But that's hopeful. Anyway, probably far in the future. Thank you, Stephen. Barry. Yeah, a couple of quick points. Um, on the first question about global versus regional, um, I, I think uh, Robert's absolutely right about what, what he said, but 
my mind, the more interesting thing is the way, which again picks up on a point you made in your in your talk about the way in which um, what the old fashioned English school calls world society um, it is playing quite a big role in this. So that if, if you look at this uh, as a global issue, it's happening in, in all three domains. It's happening in the interstate domain, it's happening in the transnational domain, and it's happening in what I rather awkwardly call the interhuman domain. And all of these things are playing into each other, which is one of the reasons why I, uh, I take the kind of slightly bullish view that I do, that um, uh, it's actually doing uh, reasonably well, or better than we might, uh, might think. Uh, on the last question, about global, uh, global risk. I mean, I don't think of it in risk terms. I have to say, I never really got my head around risk theory. Uh, uh, seemed, I don't know, incomprehensible to me. Uh, but securitization theory, I do know something about, and I think that that's related. And I think one of the key uh, issues to watch here uh, is when climate change or other aspects of environmental uh, uh, stewardship get securitized. So far, I think it's pretty clear that they haven't been securitized, and that's why you haven't got um, yet a strong link to great power management, because it's securitization that makes great power management work. Um, that's what the Security Council is about uh, in, in, in this sense. So that's, to my mind, that's the thing to keep your eye on, is at what point, it's been argued for ages and ages and ages by various people that this should be securitized, and it's so far hasn't been. So there's plenty of securitizing moves, but it, but it hasn't yet um, swept all uh, before it. But obviously, as the day-to-day you know, -day problems get, uh, get bigger, uh, the chance of that happening, and it could happen very quickly, um, you have to wonder exactly what kind of trigger event it would be, how many wildfires, how many deluges, how many floods, how many people have to die. I mean, uh, this is the kind of titanic theory of, of international relations that nothing happens until there's a big enough disaster, preferably involving the deaths of a lot of rich people. Um, what has to happen? Does New York have to disappear? What has to happen? But when it happens, it could happen quite quickly, and that would change the dynamics of it a lot. Thank you, Barry. Um, did you want to? Oh, I was just going to say I have two words for that human movement. I think human movement is going to be the thing that moves it to securitization first. And we can we can pick that up <laughs> um, in your next round of questions. So I'll turn to Ellen Holtmatt, who is a fellow in the International Relations Department here at LSE, um, who's going to read us three questions from Zoom. And in the meantime, I think we will have time for another round. So be thinking of your questions and, and raise my hand to get my attention when we come back to you. And for those on Zoom, please continue to type short questions into the Q&A box and we'll try and get to as many of you as possible. Ellen, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so one of the questions is, um, can you illustrate a little bit more about the adoption of environmental stewardship by the Global South? Right? How do we see that in their policies, in their foreign policy, for example? Um, can we really speak of acceptance of a norm if even the US didn't ratify the Kyoto Protocol, pulled out the Paris Agreement? And the last question, do we really need a solidar solidarist approach to uh, address climate change, or is that not necessarily needed? Ellen, would you just tell us the names of the people? Uh, you don't have them. That's no, okay. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> Please um, do uh, What's tell the us your name. What's the last question? So do we need a solidarist approach to address climate change? Mm -hmm. Solidarist approach. Okay. Robert, take it away. Shall I go first? Sure. Okay. Um, so the let me start with the second question on this occasion. The the US not having ratified Kyoto um, can be seen in two lights. And then the US, by the way, also uh, at one point walked away from the Paris Agreement, though that was quickly patched up uh, earlier this year. So that's that's good news. I wouldn't read too much into it in the sense that it doesn't negate a country's fundamental commitment to wanting to achieve environmental objectives. It's just that the United States has a different view of how this is best done. Okay, that might be a very generous reading of US foreign policy under George W. Bush and Donald Trump. But I think there is a, there's a more substantive side to this because if you look at the Paris Agreement, which has now a much more decentralized structure of uh, 
meeting the target of, of bringing emissions down. It's based on national contributions, which are nationally determined, so no international negotiation of who does what. It's also not got a strong compliance mechanism. It's very soft, very bottom up, uh, very voluntarist in nature. That was the original model that the United States advocated in the run up to the Rio summit when the UNFCCC, the framework convention was negotiated. And in many ways, the United States was a norm uh, contender, a, a kind of a challenger player in the climate regime, arguing against a very sort of top down internationally negotiated approach that the European Union and many developing countries favored. So I see this contestation by the US not so much as a challenge to environmentalism as such, but as a different way of, of going about achieving that goal. And while we, for a long time, we thought this was just a case of obstructionism, it has come through in the end. And now everyone's praising the Paris Agreement, including in the European Union. So we do need to recognize that there are some strange forms of leadership that we've experienced in this field. Let me stop at that. I'll come back to some other questions, perhaps. And the panelists, if you just want to signal if you want to come in. Yeah, Kathy. Well, now I have the real challenge. Robert was complaining about having a 300 page book that he had to talk about in 15 <laughs> minutes. I have an entire course on the role of developing countries in international environmental Please. governance. So like I'm having to compress a course into what I'm gonna say in the next couple of minutes. But I think one of the things to understand is that actually in the environmental area, the sort of normal power relationships are turned over a bit. I mean, when you get to the climate regime, there's a set of countries that are extremely powerful in the climate negotiations that are not powerful in any other negotiations. These are the small island states and the small island developing states. Countries that have 13,000 people in them are incredibly influential in the climate negotiations. And in, in, a, in the biodiversity negotiations, who has the world's biodiversity? developing countries do. So this is really a different domain than most of the other domains of international relations, because questions about who's powerful and who's significant are just really different than if you're talking about, I mean, a, a country with 13,000 people is not really important in the trade regime or in the security regime, but it is central to the climate regime. And so developing countries are all over these negotiations, environmental negotiations generally. And if they're not an active part at the table, if they're not participating, these are not legitimate negotiations. Their conclusions would not be legitimate. I'm not saying that they get their way. I mean, one of the things that makes the small island developing states so powerful is the way that they stand up and they say, you are killing us. The amount of money that you're offering us wouldn't be enough to buy the coffins that we're going to need for the people who are going to die from climate change. But these are very powerful moral justice arguments that they can make. And you better believe that the climate negotiations are really different because of them. So I've studied the role of the bigger emerging powers Brazil, India, South Africa, China, and there's no question but that they were different actors at Copenhagen in 2009 because other developing countries were coming to them for the first time and saying, you've got to do something. All countries need to act on climate change and you are not an exception. And had Tuvalu and Barbados and Ghana and other countries not been make Sudan, not been making those kinds of arguments, it would have been much harder to get those powerful developing countries on board. And those powerful developing countries are a critical part of any kinds of environmental negotiations. So in my view, I think the outcomes that we see, both the gains and sometimes the unwillingness to go very far, but I, I think the developing countries are just central to these negotiations always. And if you're only looking at Europe and the US, you are missing what is going on in environmental agreements. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Barry or, or Stephen, did you want to come in? Um, Barry, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I think uh, adding to, to what you were saying about the, uh, about the global south, I think there's, you know, there's a 
a strong line uh, on which India now takes the lead, but China also follows that uh, line and so does Brazil. Um, that basically the responsibility for all this is, belongs to the first round industrializers, so they've got to pay for it. Now, what interests me about that is you know, how long can they hang on to that argument you know, when all of the glaciers have melted and the rivers in South Asia have dried up? Are they going to get a different kind of message um, that basically, you know, they may be, uh, as it were, morally correct in saying, you guys started this, you should pay for it all. But when you're all in the same boat and the boat is sinking, you either bail together or, or the boat sinks. So I think there's going to be a tipping point there in, the, in those kinds of attitudes. Uh, the other thing I'd say is about on the question about solidarism. Is it necessary for climate change? Uh, I think you need to break solidarism down into two different types. I mean, there's the kind of cosmopolitan solidarism um, of, of kind of classical uh, idealists. And then there's a rather harder nosed kind of state centric solidarism of the kind that uh, enables states to do cooperative things like run, uh, run the global market. Um, I think one should look here more to, to state centric solidarism. Uh, a degree of that will be necessary. But if the issue comes down to survival, right? I'm, I'm back to securitization again. If the issue comes down to survival, then pluralism will do. I mean, the United States and the Soviet Union were able to talk about arms control on the basis that it was a survival issue. If they, if they made mistakes with all of this nuclear stuff, they would both be blown away, possibly accidentally. And they didn't want that. So if, as it were, the, the concerns about the environment reach that level of this is a survival issue, then pluralism will be enough. Robert, you want Just to, yeah. Just a brief comment on that as well. Um, I think climate change carries the risk, particularly if it if global warming runs out of control, if, if it accelerates and reaches tipping points, that the current project of trying to limit emissions to prevent catastrophic climate change will become increasingly futile. Mm -hmm. And we switch from a collective solidarist state-centric solution to an uh, individualistic nationalist solution, a more pluralist solution, where countries will just have to look after themselves, adaptation over mitigation. And that could, in my view, produce that kind of forced switch from solidarism to pluralism, with which the kind of response that you described. Now, that could be just the great powers protecting themselves and going after geoengineering solutions or some collective response. That's the more hopeful outcome. But I think there's a risk that the quality of international cooperation will deteriorate rapidly as countries realize that it's too late to prevent and therefore they will channel all their energies into a nationalist response. And there's an interesting talk on the political right in North America, but also in other parts of the world mm -hmm. that have pr brought up climate migration now as probably mm -hmm. the biggest threat, why they want to engage because they see that as the thing that we need to prevent. That would change the quality of, of international relations quite dramatically. Stephen, did you have anything you wanted to add, or should we see if we can fit in a, co a couple? Go, go ahead and let, let others ask questions. That's we'll come back to you before we close. So we have about seven minutes. Um, we can take maybe one or two more questions from in here, if anybody wants to. And otherwise, I will ask Ellen if there are any more questions online. Does anybody in the room want to ask? OK, wonderful. If you can state your name and press the mic. Button. Uh, yes, you have to keep it. You have to keep, keep the button. Oh, yeah. My Perfect. name is Elena. I'm a master's student in environment and development at the C. So my question is about non-governmental organizations. Um, right now, many non-governmental organizations um, are actively involved in international negotiations. Uh, but uh, I think that mainly large international NGOs um, has real ability to participate in these negotiations. And these NGOs are often criticized for being non-representative because they don't have direct links to civil actors on the local level. So uh, can uh, environmental NGOs uh, really represent uh, the society or do they just imitate this representation to provide some sort of fake public license to governmental actors? Thank you. Thank you so much. Elena, was it your name? Yeah, okay, thank you. And Ellen, let me pass back to you then just maybe for, I think we, you can 
read out maybe one or two more questions, depending. Okay, so um, there's one question on, on uh, environmentalism and sovereignty. So if environmentalism would be able to overcome sovereignty, then what would that uh, mean for our future COPs? Um, and is the weakness of the national response, is it really due to just the power of the fossil fuel industry? Okay. Excellent questions. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll give you the last word, Robert. And so I'll, Stephen, I don't know if you wanted to come in first since you didn't, um, or. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to be brief. These are all really big, big questions, I think that that would, you know, could require lengthy discussions. But um, uh, anyway, I'll be very brief. So the first first question on NGOs. Um, it, it's a terrific question on, on the one hand. On the other hand, I think that the, the landscape of NGOs has become um, quite complex and quite elaborate, especially in the space of climate change, but we could talk about it in, in other issue areas of the environment as well. Um, there's terrific work out there that I encourage you to read uh, on um, contestation among different NGOs, um, on the ways in which access and so on of, of, of various groups um, large and small particular communities. Um, there's lots of concerns about representation and about uh, especially indigenous communities. I mean, just to take an example, you know, about 80% of forests uh, protected uh, spaces where biodiversity is are in essence um, where indigenous groups need to be engaged to deal with that, that particular issue. So um, on the one hand, those voices are being included in a way as never before. On the other hand, there's still complaints that the, at, at the international level anyway, the, the access and ability to engage um, has, has been limited. So, um, but I don't think it's just a matter of the big NGO somehow dominating because the landscape has gotten more complex. Um, and also the landscape of action has gotten more complex, which involves lots of other actors. Um, the only other question I'll weigh in on is the fossil fuel one. So of course, this is, you know, incumbent industries, fossil fuel industries, enormously important. Um, the politics in particular states is where to look for this, I think, not so much at the international level, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and again, the politics has become um, very interesting in that, yes, there is still resistance slowing down. I mean, just to take a funny, ex a weird example for me, you know, Toyota is now resisting um, big mandates for electric vehicles because Toyota invested in hybrids. And so they don't want other companies to leapfrog over them. So this is very essentially important. On the other hand, the kinds of transformation that Robert's talking about in the book, I think, are interesting in the sense, and what Barry was talking about, is whether or not the shifts in the market are now forcing uh, companies to, not that they're not going to still pursue their interests, but to reevaluate how, how that's going to be pursued. So I think that's um, the, place, the, the place to look um, for where these politics are playing out. Thank you, Stephen. So it's 7.59. So I, if you don't mind, um, Barry and, and Kathy, I know you would have lots to say on all of these on all of these questions, but I think I'll turn to Robert for the last word and then I'll uh, thank everybody for being here. Well, that's very kind of you. And um, I shall not abuse that last word to, to <laughs> answer in great depth uh, the questions. Um, I just want to perhaps highlight that um, in international relations, and many of you are studying international relations, it's easy to treat questions such as climate change as perhaps slightly marginal and peripheral. After all, there's that high sounding drama of the princes that Karl Marx wrote about, what we call diplomacy, and that's where the big decisions are taken, uh, war and peace and so on. And I, I just think that we, we have moved on in the field of international relations and we've begun to realize that these are quite existential questions we're addressing here when we talk about ecology and climate change and so on. This is about the future of the planet, the future of human societies and the future of a stable international order that can function and, and deliver what it's supposed to do. So I, I hope you will all engage in these big questions and not be deterred by those who tell you otherwise that you should leave this to the, um, the engineers and the natural scientists. Um, can I just say a last word to Stephen? to Kathy and to Barry and uh, of course to Millie for engaging in that discussion tonight. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and thanks to everyone for turning up. Really pleased and honored that you've come out tonight. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Robert. And just to close the event, I'll just thank again, reiterate Robert's thanks to all of you for being here, to the panelists for taking part. We're so grateful you could find the time to, to share your thoughts with us, even though it's one of the coolest things you can do to a group of professors to uh, ask them to talk about their areas of expertise in 30 seconds or less in answer to all these really wonderful questions. So just a reminder, if you're interested in learning more about the themes of the event, you can um, purchase Dr. Robert Faulkner's book, Environmentalism and Global International Society. And I'll close the event there. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you.